Thanks for joining us here on this web exclusive. I'm Kelly Sullivan, joined by Eyewitness News Analyst, retired Lieutenant General Reginald Centracchio. And General, first we want to talk about President Obama recently releasing more than a dozen detainees from Gitmo, and he's still focused on closing Gitmo. What's the impact of that? Well, the impact is to make sure we understand the difference between Gitmo, which is usually referred to as the detention center. Guantanamo Naval Station is a, the entire complex. So when we talk about closing Gitmo, I would hope they're only talking about that detention center and not the entire facility, because we have a lease on that uh, base uh, with Cuba uh, for the next bunch of years. So uh, it's always a question when, when people talk about closing Gitmo, um, there's always the question that lingers if you know anything about that facility. Uh, there's also the rest of the story, which is the Guantanamo Naval Station and Gitmo is only the detention center that he's looking to close. And that's not really been clarified. Mm -hmm. But the hope is it's just the detention center? Absolutely. Otherwise, that would be, uh, in my opinion, devastating to lose that facility uh, um, as a matter of uh, having been there for so many years and having a strategic location within the, uh, the Caribbean. All right, General, now uh, some major developments overseas. Russia is using air bases in Iran to bomb ISIS targets, but it's also bombing some anti-Assad targets. Is this counterproductive for the U.S.? It certainly is. You know, the U.S. has said uh, so many times that uh, Assad has got to go. At the same time, we're looking for Russian support to take down ISIS. Uh, but it, once again, you have Russian aircraft flying out of Iran uh, to do this, uh, hoping that they're going to help us with ISIS, but at the same time they're hurting us by uh, hitting the, uh, the units that are obviously pro-Assad. Is, is it hard to trust Russia at this point with what well, they're doing? Well, I think it's very hard because you don't have the intelligence on the ground. Uh, that intelligence that we get would suggest that that's exactly what's happening. But nothing definitive because we don't have people on the ground there to be able to tell us uh, this is happening and that's not happening. So something that we're obviously going to have to continue to watch very closely. Absolutely. And we have talks coming up to try to resolve that. In the midst of all this, you have this uh, controversy going on, and it's not certainly productive to getting in talks to mean anything. Mm -hmm. All right, now let's switch gears to the Olympics. We're more than halfway through at this point, and obviously a lot has been talked about security at Rio, making sure everybody who is at the Olympics is safe, they're having fun and enjoying watching the athletes compete. And so far, so good, except we did have that one incident we heard about with those four swimmers, but it's because they might have been out of that security zone? You're right on. That's the exact point. Uh, when you have a security plan, this, it can only reach out so far. Once you go beyond the, the security, uh, in-depth security, you get to less and less security. Then once you're beyond that, you're on your own. As far as being out in the city, you have to really depend upon the, the uh, law enforcement uh, personnel in that city. And certainly they're not uh, part of the overall plan for Rio. So your point is well taken in reference to uh, uh, when something happens like this, it's not because the security plan failed, it's because they went outside the parameters of what security is in place. There was a lot of concern before the Olympics started, too, because of security and the way things were in uh, Brazil and in that area. It was a little bit, uh, you know, uncertain as far as would people be safe. But so far, we are seeing that, in fact, it, it is working. And I think you certainly have some, uh, I guess, reason for the people to, uh, uh, to demonstrate and have protests, as we have seen. Uh, because of the uh, the amount of poverty that's in the area, and yet they see this happening in the midst of all that with literally billions of dollars being spent. But I read something today, and I saw something that uh, gave me a little bit of comfort, uh, and that was that any excess food stuff that they have is going to that effort. So I guess that's good in one way. That is. And just lastly, too, General, we want to talk about um, the Red Cross volunteers from Rhode Island heading down to Louisiana with the devastating flooding there. Uh, we just ran a story yesterday. They're looking for volunteers to send down there. And the interesting thing I think about this is they're at, they say, you know, training for a week and then you'll be sent down there for about two weeks. So if you hear Red Cross volunteers, you necessarily don't have to have any training at all if, if you want to go down and help. Right. And I think uh, you, when you hear Red Cross, you normally associate that with medical. Uh, that's not necessarily the case. There's a, a huge demand for the logistics aspects, the communications and other things that aren't related to the medical application of uh, personnel taking care of people who have been injured and stuff. Uh, so I think when you respond to that, uh, what they're looking for is an overall capacity to be able to go down and help in any way. Mm -hmm. All right, General, thanks so much. And thanks for joining us on this web exclusive.